Huawei's Meng Wanzhou strikes a deal. My life has been turned upside down. What she's agreed to and what it means for Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. It's completely up to the top political powers in Beijing. Also breaking, the Catholic bishops of Canada apologize. The mea culpa for their role in residential schools. Potential help for certain COVID patients. We can't just sit idle by and let them get infected and deteriorate. The roadblocks to getting this antibody cocktail in Canada. And where in the world is Wally? He doesn't need a passport to travel. The whimsical walrus making a splash. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Farah Nasser. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. We begin with major breaking news in the case of Meng Wanzhou. After nearly three years under house arrest in Vancouver, the Huawei executive is free and en route back to China at this hour because she struck a deal with U.S. prosecutors. New video shows the Air China flight Meng was on taking off from Vancouver International Airport shortly after she left the courthouse. With the U.S. deal now in place, the request to extradite her from Canada to the States has been dropped. And for the first time since her arrest, she spoke publicly. Over the past three years, my life has been turned upside down. It was disruptive time for me as a mother, a wife, and a company executive. But I believe every cloud has a silver lining. I will never forget all the good wishes I've received from people around the world. Robin Gill has tonight's top story on the deal that Meng struck. Meng Wanzhou is free and thanking Canada. I'd like to thank the Honorable Associate Chief Justice Holmes for her fairness in the whole legal proceedings and the Canadian government for upholding the rule of law. This was the first time since her extradition battle began we've heard her speak. To my family, to my friends, to everyone who provided care and help for me. Three years of legal battles over after 12 minutes in BC's Supreme Court. Earlier, the CFO and heiress to the Huawei empire appeared via video conference in a New York courtroom. She and the American government signed a deferred prosecution agreement. We don't know the full terms of the DPA. She may face significant fines, but Meng doesn't have to plead guilty. U.S. prosecutors said that if Meng complies, the criminal charges against her will be dismissed bank fraud, wire fraud, and two related conspiracy counts. And it will end December 1st, 2022, four years from her arrest at Vancouver's airport. Richard Curland, an immigration lawyer, has been watching her case from day one. You don't want a lengthy, expensive litigation, and you don't want someone to go scot-free. So the mid-ground is the fur prosecution agreement, where you say you're not guilty, but you're admitting to wrongdoing and paying a hefty fine. Okay, let's move her back in. Meng was arrested in 2018 at the request of the United States, always maintaining her innocence. Now she's willing to take some responsibility, admitting in a statement of facts she concealed the truth of Huawei's business in Iran and that she made multiple misrepresentations and engaged in a concerted effort to deceive a global financial institution. She was accused of using a Huawei subsidiary, Skycom, to sell computer equipment to Iran and misleading HSBC's American banks to do that deal, which is a violation of sanctions against Iran. Now that HSBC has pulled the plug on its U.S. banking operations, there's no reason to continue prosecution against Huawei and Meng. Meng did shed some tears when she realized she was free, but she didn't bother to go home to her multi-million dollar house in Vancouver, which has been part of her house arrest. Instead, she made a beeline for the airport, boarded a flight to China, free of that ankle bracelet, free of those security guards that she had to pay for. She realized she finally had her freedom, and this now puts an end to that saga, at least one chapter of it, that put Canada in the middle of a war between two superpowers. Farah? Robin Gill at Vancouver International Airport. Thank you, Robin. The deal with Meng Wanzhou comes at a tense time in U.S.-China relations, with President Biden ramping up international pressure on China 
over its conduct in recent days. Jackson Prosco joins us now from Washington. Jackson, what more do we know about how today's agreement with Meng came to be? Well, Farah, negotiations with Meng Wanzhou and the U.S. Justice Department reportedly began last summer under President Trump. But the two sides finally came to this agreement against a backdrop of mounting pressure on China over the treatment of those two detained Canadians, something the U.S. Secretary of State raised during a tense meeting with his Chinese counterpart back in March. We know that Prime Minister Trudeau and President Biden have spoken repeatedly about working to secure the release of the two Michaels. Biden himself publicly raised the issue. Human beings are not bartering chips. You know, we're going to work together until we get their safe return. So, Farah, even though the Justice Department is politically independent, today's decision at least has the benefit of removing Canada as the middleman in this tense situation between the U.S. and China and perhaps helps to thaw relations with all three countries if it does eventually result in the freedom for the two detained Canadians. Yeah, so Jackson, what does this mean then uh, for the relationship between the U.S. and China moving forward? W will it help it improve? Well, you know, big picture, Biden has spoken extensively about his desire for competition, not conflict with China. In fact, while Meng Wanzhou was in court today, Biden was actually at the White House meeting with the leaders of India, Australia and Japan to talk about the very issue of countering China. And of course, just last week, the U.S. agreed to that pact with Australia and Great Britain for nuclear powered submarines, again, to counter China's growing influence. Of course, even with Meng's release, the core issue at the center of all of this, the reach and influence of Chinese technology giant Huawei, is unlikely to disappear. And China has already now sent this very clear message that countries who support U.S. efforts could end up paying a very steep price. Farah? Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thank you, Jackson. A prominent arm of the Catholic Church is apologizing to Indigenous peoples of Canada for the suffering experienced in residential schools. In a statement, the Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops expresses their profound remorse and apologize unequivocally. They say many Catholics participated in the residential school system, leading to the suppression of Indigenous languages, culture and spirituality. And they acknowledge the grave abuses committed by some members of the Catholic community. They say they are fully committed to the process of healing and reconciliation. Hundreds of unmarked graves were found at the sites of several former residential schools earlier this year. The head of emergency medicine for the Alberta Medical Association is warning the province is close to implementing its critical triage protocol. We haven't triggered it yet, but we're literally sitting and standing on the edge of the cliff right now. Dr. Paul Park says the critical triage document is triggered when there are only a couple of ICU beds left across the province. But he notes surgeries are already being cancelled and transfers are being delayed. These are all components of triage protocol. New Brunswick has reimposed a state of emergency after another record-breaking day of new COVID-19 cases. The order means a return to household bubbles and limits on close contacts and gatherings. Premier Blaine Higgs says the order will be reviewed every two weeks. Canada's top doctor says active talks are now underway with other countries to allow the entry of Canadians with mixed COVID-19 vaccine doses. Dr. Theresa Tam says the Public Health Agency of Canada is presenting data to countries like the U.S. on the effectiveness of a mixed dose schedule. The issue isn't with the MRA vaccines in terms of a interchangeability. It's for example, they have not used AstraZeneca vaccine in the United States and certainly not a mixed dose schedule. Um, and as a result, they don't have um, domestically generated information on that front. Tam says the U.S. is still in the process of deliberation on accepting mixed doses. Canadians are asked to check on specific country requirements before making travel plans. The World Health Organization is now backing an expensive antibody treatment for high-risk COVID-19 patients. Experts say it could help some people avoid serious outcomes. But in Canada, the supply is limited and provinces are slow to offer the treatment, if at all. Jamie Morocco reports. As long COVID patient Lisa Urbanski struggles to do what used to be so simple, she can't help but wonder if early intervention could have helped. It's incredibly hard to get up in the morning, um, incredibly hard. It's almost like there's a heaviness 
in my brain. Monoclonal antibodies offered commonly in the U.S. might have prevented the 37-year-old's pain. We caught it early, early enough on that this would really make a huge impact for the better. The World Health Organization now agrees. It says a monoclonal antibody cocktail may keep people with mild to moderate COVID-19 out of the ICU. But if we haven't been immunized or we haven't been previously infected, we don't have those antibodies. So one way to um, help us along in fighting infection in the absence of being uh, having immunity is to actually administer uh, those kind of antibodies. Canada has just 6,000 doses of the Regeneron drug, with 3,000 more on the way. Compared to the 3 million the Biden administration has procured, it's peanuts. The area where there's the biggest gap in terms of, of uh, having an effective treatment is for outpatients with mild disease. While Regeneron may fill this gap, provinces aren't using what limited supply they have. At $2,500 a pop Canadian, experts say the hefty price tag is partially to blame. It's not really fundamentally about cost. Um, uh, there's, there's access, but also uh, feasibility of delivery. Until recently, the treatment was only administered intravenously. A roadblock Dr. Don Vin is navigating around, creating a safe space to offer the drug in Montreal for immunocompromised COVID patients. We can't just sit idle by and let them, uh, let them get infected and deteriorate. Vin hopes a new injectable version of the drug will make it easier for all hospitals and clinics to offer. I would have given everything I have to have something to help me. A tool we have been slow to use that could help vulnerable COVID patients early on. Jamie Marocker, Global News, Toronto. Multiplying calls to better protect women in London. Coming up, the murder case prompting demands for the government to take action. Investigators in London are asking for the public's help as they try to solve the murder of 28-year-old Sabina Nessa. It's believed the teacher was on a five-minute walk to meet a friend when she was killed. A 38-year-old man has been arrested. But police are also looking for this man. Detectives released this video showing him walking in the area where Nessa was attacked. As Crystal Gamansing reports, there's grief and anger, not just over Nessa's death, but a growing epidemic of violence against women. I just want to say thank you for everyone who came here to show their support and respect for my sister. Heartbroken, Sabina Nessa's sister tried to tell the crowd about the loving young teacher taken from her family. Mixed in with the tears and candles, there is anger here. So we need every member of our community to come together and say no more. Last Friday, the 28-year-old was on her way to meet a friend. She took the path through a connecting park. It was there her body was discovered the next day. For too long, the burden of women's safety has been on women's shoulders, and we're just tired. Tired of being afraid, tired of mourning. This mound of flowers grew a few months back in memory of Sarah Everard. She was walking home from a friend's house in March when she was kidnapped, raped, and strangled to death. Wayne Cousin, a Metropolitan Police constable, pleaded guilty to her murder. In the UK, it is estimated a woman is killed by a man every three days. A statistic the Mayor of London says is unacceptable. I think this uh, you know, deserves the same priority as counter-terrorism. I agree with the, uh, the inspector who uh, called this an epidemic. If the government just listened and did rather than thought and talked, I think we'd see a lot more progress. One of the most moving moments of the vigil was when everyone in the crowd was asked to repeat her name three separate times, Sabina. And while there are calls for the violence against women to end the reality of the situation, literally just steps away. Police officers in hazmat suits searching for clues. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. Ahead from Halifax to Berlin, thousands around the world march to fight climate change. Thousands of youth activists flooded streets across Canada. It's the first mass climate strike since the pandemic ground large gatherings to a halt. The International 
Fridays for Future movement is calling on governments to do more, including adding programs to school curriculums and ending eviction from homeless camps. In Ontario, they're asking the newly re-elected Liberal government to deliver on the climate promises that were made during the campaign. Power to the people! More than 1,400 climate events were held globally. From the UK to Japan, India and Sierra Leone, demonstrators were warning the planet faces imminent danger if there isn't a sharp cut in greenhouse gas emissions. In Germany, tens of thousands of people rallied outside Parliament, led by teenage activist Greta Thunberg, who sparked the Mass Climate Initiative three years ago. She's accusing politicians of falling short, saying their programs aren't far-reaching enough to limit global warming. Swimming into the spotlight next, tracking the journey of Wally the Walrus. Tonight, we're ending the newscast with a story about a traveling walrus named Wally. The Arctic mammal gained fame while summering in Europe and was seen in Ireland earlier this month. Eric Sorensen tonight on Where in the World is Wally? Like an explorer in the New World, he first set Flipper on the shores of Southern Ireland last spring. He's huge. Next stop, the coast of Wales. They called him Wally, naturally, a four-year-old one-ton Arctic walrus, probably a male. This poor guy's turned up over here on a very, very long journey, very, very far away from home. One worry is that walruses are losing sea ice to climate change and venturing further from the Arctic. They're losing habitat, so we can expect to see more and more of those Arctic species um, becoming vagrants and becoming displaced from their native habitats. But out on his own, it's likely this intrepid pinniped is touring, an adventurer like so many teenagers, says one Canadian walrus expert. Teenage males that seem to um, have this wanderlust. It seems that all animals have this natural curiosity about the world. <laughs> Well, this guy sure does. He looks nothing like any other walrus you've ever... Actually, he looks like every other walrus. But Wally has identifiable scars on his flippers. In Tenby, Wales, he lounged for days. The locals watched, and shops sold Wally pillows and playthings. He came from somewhere in the Arctic, part explorer, part tourist, swam thousands of kilometers to Ireland and the UK, was later spotted as far south as France and the waters off northern Spain, and then back to Ireland, this time County Cork. And finally, a three-week, 900-kilometer swim to Iceland. Yes. Whenever he surfaced, he just wanted a little sun, a little rest, on a dinghy here or something more sturdy there. And maybe take a boat for a spin like any sightseer. Bristly-faced, blubbery, and seemingly benevolent. They're sort of whimsical. They've got personality, character. Um, they're just such a, an amazing, wonderful animal. The massive mammal has made waves across the North Atlantic. Presumably he's now feeding in around Iceland, packing it on to get him to that next step of his journey. Reaching Iceland probably means he's on his way back to the high Arctic to be with other walruses. What a story he'll have. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. A walrus with wanderlust. After the past 18 months, I'm sure many of us can relate. That's Global National for this Friday night. I'm Farah Nasser. Thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. Tonight's Your Canada is beautiful Northern Bay, Newfoundland and Labrador. Robin Gill will be with you on the Anchor Desk tomorrow. Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other.